So who would like to open in prayer today? You can take a mic and... Sure. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. Thank you that we can be uh, in this place to serve and worship you. Father, we pray that you would just use uh, Keith and, and your scripture in a powerful way. We pray that our eyes would be open and our hearts would be receptive to the truth that's contained in your word. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're continuing. Um, we're using this book, The Word Made Flesh, which is um, Ligonier's Christology Statement. And today we're going to be looking at Article 2. And if you look at the header on the page here that we're looking at, it's saying... Um, Affirmation and denial, unity of the Godhead. So that is what we're looking at today. Um, again, uh, can somebody read where it says Article 2 and the af affirmation and the denial? Uh, uh, using a mic. So wh who would? Okay, right. It says, we affirm that in the unity of the Godhead, the eternally begotten Son is consubstantial, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. We deny that the Son is merely like God, or that he is or was simply adopted by the Father as his Son. We deny the eternal subordination of the Son to the Father in the ontological trinity. Okay, now, there are two words that are in parentheses there. They are theological terms, and I'm going to read them because I went to a website and figured out the pronunciation of these words. And they look almost the same. It's homoousios and homoousios. They are very similar, but as you'll notice, it seems like a, almost a minor difference. And before we continue in this, I'm going to read the definitions in a second, but I want us to understand that um, Francis Schaeffer pointed out something in one of his books, I forget which one, but he pointed out there are items that are doctrine which are people believe them, but they not necessary to be a Christian. But then there are things that are dogma, which if you want to be a Christian, you need to believe these things. And when we talk about Christ and the things that we believe about Christ, we're not talking about doctrine, we're talking about dogma. If you want to be a Christian, then you need to understand what the truth is about who Jesus is. And that's one of the things that we're looking at here. And though they may seem subtle, when I, when I go through these definitions, there's a vast gulf between the full understanding of that subtle difference. And the one difference makes you a Christian, and the other one makes you not. So it's important to understand that as we go through this. So the homoousios, which is what um, we believe or we affirm is in the Council of Nicaea it was Homosius that was at issue is the Son one substance with the Father in essence they are the same they're the same stuff if you, so to speak if you want to use the term stuff but essentially the essence of the Son and the essence of the Father are the same essence. If the Son was the Word inside of the Father before his begetting in eternity past, then he is one substance with the Father. In other words, he's made of the same divine stuff, substance, material, or essence as the Father because he came out of the Father. If he was created from nothing, 
then God must have used something to create him. Now, here's an important part of why we understand that this is different, is that John 1, 1 to 3, it says he created all things, and there was not one thing that was created that he didn't create. So Jesus did not create himself. That's an impossibility. It's a logical fallacy to think that. Jesus created everything that was created. So Jesus can't be a created being. So John 1.1 1, 1 specifically talks about that. Or John 1.1-3 1, 1 specifically talk about that. And it says here, probably whatever the angels... Greek Christians simply called the substance matter. If that's what the sun was made from, the Nicene Council reasoned, then he is not really God. So the difference is between of the same substance and of like substance. And that seems like such a small difference. But it is really the difference of what makes us Christians, is that we believe Jesus is the same substance as God. They are co-eternal. They are co-equal. And here it is, co-substantial, of the same stuff, of the same substance. That's what co-substantial is talking about. And yes, the Nicene Creed is that first time that the church formally set this as an official understanding of what the Bible teaches about Jesus. Um, the homoousius, which I think says... Um, of similar substance, of similar essence. It is a term used in the fourth century for a heretical group that described the relationship between the Father and the Son. This is an improper term to use when describing the relationship between the Father and the Son. They are not of similar essence. Rather, they are the same. In other words, according to the correct doctrine of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit share the same essence. And it's important for us to understand that. And we are going to be looking at the Trinity and how the Bible teaches it, the verses that actually talk about this co-substantial, co-equal, and co-eternal. Throughout the Bible... Somebody want to read Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we see here Jesus himself, the Great Commission, what we are supposed to be teaching. And what does he say? Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Not one, not two, but all three. So he's commanding us right here, saying, this is what you're supposed to be teaching. And when they come to know Christ, me, as their Lord and Savior, you are to baptize them in this fashion. Somebody want to read John 1, 14 through 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who came, comes after me has a higher rank than I, 
For he exalted before me, existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Okay, so it's interesting. John the Baptist was called upon to make straight the path for Jesus. And he testifies about Jesus who came before him. What's so interesting about that, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. He was born six months before Jesus, and yet he testifies, Jesus came before me. That means Jesus existed throughout all eternity. John is testifying about that right here, co-eternal. But he also talks about this here where it says, and I, I like the New American Standard 1995 version as opposed to the 2020, because it says it the way it actually says it in the original, where it says, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. The 2020 says the only begotten Son. Yes, we, we, we are referring to the Son, but the word in the original is theos, God. So in reference to Jesus, John the Baptist is saying, the only begotten God. He's making a very positive affirmation that Jesus is God. There's no doubt as to who he's talking about here, but he calls him God. And that's important to understand, that right from the beginning, before Jesus' ministry officially started, if you will, at the kickoff of his ministry, John the Baptist is calling him God. And saying, he existed before I did. There's no way of getting around that. Okay, somebody want to read John three sixteen through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, so again, here we see. The promise of eternal life. And it says, He didn't send him to judge the world, but that the world may be saved through him. And then, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in him is judged already because he did not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Again, there's this aspect. Remember, in Hebrews, it talks about Abraham, by his faith, God reckoned it to, and also Romans, God reckoned it as righteousness. In, in Hebrews, it talks about, in the great chapter of faith, it talks about his belief and his following God. And in Romans, it specifically says that it was his faith that caused his sins to be forgiven. And here, John is saying, faith in Jesus leads to forgiveness of sin. So faith in God leads to forgiveness of sin. And faith in Jesus leads to forgiveness of sin. Then it is the same. Now they're not the same person, but they are the same substance, the same God. 
Somebody want to read John 10:29 to 33. My Father has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. From which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. So we see here, when Jesus says this, there is no doubt what he is claiming. He's saying, I and the Father are one. No doubt so much that the Pharisees and the scribes took up stones to stone him. And he asked them, why? What good thing did I do that makes you want to stone me? And they said, because you call yourself equal with God. We are picking up these stones to stone you. In other words, they considered what Jesus did blasphemy. So we're seeing here, he is making a very specific claim. A claim to be God. He's not making a claim to be the Father because he said, everything I do comes from the Father. But he doesn't claim to be the Father. He claims to be obeying the Father. He claims to be following the Father. He claims to be doing what the Father tells him to do, but he does not claim to be the Father. He claims to be God, who is equal, co-equal, which hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> but it is what the Bible teaches, and it's important for us to understand that this is the case. Somebody want to read John 20? Verses 27 through 28. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. So Jesus here, proving his resurrection to Thomas in a very real and substantial way by telling Thomas, don't doubt, but believe, and not just believe in this idea. Go ahead, touch me. Put your hand in the wound. And Thomas worships him. Jesus did not tell him, don't worship me. Jesus accepted that worship as God. Thomas did say, my Lord and my God, when he saw Jesus, the resurrected one. Somebody want to read 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is Paul's closing to the Corinthians in the end of his letter. And notice the blessing. He ties all three of the persons of the Godhead together in this greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Notice he's pointing out three different kinds of things here. He's talking about grace. Well, Jesus came so that we may experience grace. The love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The fellowship of the Spirit. One of the things that Paul tells us in Ephesians is we are sealed. The Holy Spirit himself is the earnest or the down payment of our future inheritance. And we are sealed. He has come into our hearts to fellowship with us, to empower us, to guide us, to teach us. 
Those are parts of who the Holy Spirit is. We don't hear much or see much or whatever, but the scriptures are very clear about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in that, yes, because we don't hear, well, what is it all about? Jesus tells us that he will glorify me. He will teach you about me. In other words, the whole ministry of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into a closer relationship with Jesus. He points us at Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who is the one who lived that perfect life, died on the cross, took my sins, and rose from the dead. That's what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is, a very quiet, unassuming ministry in our hearts, changing us, making us into the new person God has made us to be, sanctifying us on a day-to-day -day basis. And then Ephesians 2, 15 through 18. Somebody want to read that? The mic's not on. <laughs> There's a green light that lights up when it's on. There you go. <laughs> by, <laughs> by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father." So again, we see the Trinity clearly spelled out here. The Father, the author, or the, the architect of the plan. Jesus who comes and implements the plan. And then the Holy Spirit who brings us peace and gives us access. So that's what we're seeing, is that the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit each have a part in the ministry, that ministry of salvation. And it's very clear here that Paul is getting at <clears throat> all three persons of the Godhead have a very important role in the plan of salvation. Again, salvation is really where it all comes together who God really is. And it is all a testimony to God's great goodness, God's great love, God's immense forgiveness. That he has provided a way. And we can never get away from what Jesus did on the cross. Because what Jesus did on the cross is fundamental to who we are as new creatures in Christ. Can't get away from it. There is, I mean, it is the rock, the foundation, everything. Is who Jesus is. So it's important for us to understand just who he is, what he did, and the fact that he, the Father, and the Spirit as co-equal persons, co-eternal persons, co-substantial persons, all took part in this plan. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the love and the grace and the kindness that you've shown to us. We thank you for all that you have done that you would that you have made a way for us to be forgiven, for us to become new creatures, 
and for us to change into the likeness of our Lord and Savior. We pray that you'd help us to grow in faith, to grow in, in ways that are visible to the world that we are different, and the reason we're different is because of what you did on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.